Well, we all love the idea of living in another dimension, don't we? Yeah? I, like, somewhere just beyond the thin veil of our ridiculously normal existence, that there's something sort of special just a bit beyond. There's a, a different form of existence, a different form of life where the normal laws of nature don't apply and where we are transported into something sort of miraculous and abnormal and exciting and different. Um, if uh, you've ever visited um, one of the Disney resorts over the last decade or so, uh, as you go through the gates above, it, above you, it would have said, where dreams come true. Um, and there's a whole industry that sort of has encouraged us to think that there is this sort of new existence, this new um, uh, way of living that is just sort of beyond our reach, that one day we might just wake up in some new existence, that we might fall down the rabbit hole and find ourselves somewhere else. That we might climb into a wardrobe and there's a new reality there for us, an alternate reality where our norms and our expectations are shaken, are twisted and are remade. And in each of these worlds, we typically find that there is some great teacher or guide to help lead us. Gandalf, Dumbledore, Aslan, Morpheus, Yoda, Tony Stark, Edna Mode. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I thought there might be just a generational moment there. You need to go and watch The Incredibles. You have seen that. Edna's the short lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, these guides, these, uh, these helps, these teachers are sometimes eccentric. They're often unpredictable. But if you want to navigate your way through this new world that you have just stepped into and to understand the laws that are at work there, then you are going to have to heed them, have to listen to them. Um, here we go. This, uh, uh, this was a, a few years ago. I, I took Kezia to Harry Potter World. And uh, for those of you who are perhaps slightly unfamiliar with the stories, um, Harry has to catch the train to go to Hogwarts. Um, and so he turns up at King's Cross Station with a ticket to get on the train, which is at platform nine and three quarters. Um, and if you go to uh, King's Cross, actually, as I happened to do only uh, last week or the week before, um, there... Uh, on in the, the platform area is a wall with one of these trolleys kind of partway through the wall because Harry has to, to run with his trolley at the wall in order to break through into this new world, the, the wizarding world that he is going to inhabit. And a few years ago, Kez and I went to Harry Potter World and everyone just lines up to have their photo taken, sort of poised at that moment where they are about to break through from this present reality, the mundanity of everything that we sort of live with, the frustrations of our current life, into this moment where there is something wonderful, where suddenly we've got magic at our fingertips and there is a different quality and texture to the life that we live. Um, some of you uh, may have seen... Uh, this film, which came out a little bit more recently, is, uh, it's about four years old, I think, uh, now, Ready Player One. Um, uh, in that film, all of the characters are living in this, I mean, sort of hideously dystopian world where uh, they are surrounded by poverty and there is very little opportunity for them um, in, uh, in life. And so what they do in order to sort of assuage their feelings of helplessness and powerlessness is they completely absorb themselves in a virtual reality. So they stick on these goggles and in some cases these amazing sort of haptic suits and that sort of thing and they all enter into the game that, uh, that is going to 
give them opportunity and actually lead to wealth and riches and all of those sorts of things. They want to escape into that virtual world. So long before Star Wars or Harry Potter or The Matrix or uh, Lord of the Rings or Ready Player One, Jesus said this, he said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. This is our platform nine and three quarters. This is our wardrobe. This is the means by which Jesus says you get to enter into a dynamic and a life that is different from that which you observe amongst those around you. This is the means by which so even though you're walking down the sort of the same road or in the same shops or amongst sort of all of those people around you in your community or in your work or in your college or school or wherever it is, that somehow that by this gateway, you enter into a life that has a different quality to it. It isn't expressed with lightsabers and wands. But it is nonetheless a, a life that has a different quality to it. There's something about it which is more exciting, more adventurous, more filled with unexpected experience. Something where actually heaven breaks down into our very normal, very meagre existence. And through this gateway, we find ourselves experiencing something altogether different. There are two realities that sit side by side. There is nothing between them. And yet in this moment of choice to decide which gate we're going to walk through, the narrow gate or the broad gate, we find ourselves in very, very different worlds. And so we sang that song this morning, which John then uh, got us to think about, about a better word. And he said, it's, it's simply this, that when you choose the promise that has been laid out for you by Jesus, then you get to live a different life. When you choose the promise that's made available to us in Christ, in the hope that he brings to us, if we're willing to recognise that what he did on the cross in choosing, him choosing to die for us, to offer us salvation, then in that moment of choice, we walk through the narrow gate. We, we cease to walk on that broad path that everyone else is walking on. We turn aside and somewhere in this in this narrow gate, on this narrow path, we start to walk into a completely new form of existence. A life that is free from shame. A life where the guilt that we've perhaps carried with us is lifted off us. A life where we no longer feel like we lack purpose, but actually God comes to us and he gives us fresh purpose. No longer a life where we feel a lack of acceptance, but a life in which his love, his kindness, his acceptance, his mercy, his grace cascades into our hearts and transforms us from the inside out. That's what happens when we step through the small gate, when we step onto the narrow path, when we choose to have our moment where we walk into a new existence which is just ever so close to us at any moment. So we're moving through this series where we've been looking at what's called the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew chapters 5 through 7 uh, in the New Testament, Jesus has been laying out for those people who had gathered to listen to him as he taught uh, on a hillside 
And we've been following this great sweep of teaching that Jesus has laid out for those who were gathered there and uh, teaching that has taken us from the Beatitudes where we hear this amazing, these amazing qualities actually that are there for those who choose to follow Christ through uh, teaching on murder and adultery and divorce and revenge and care for the poor and prayer and fasting and provision and fear and judgment. And he's talking about the quality and the calibre of life that is lived out in his kingdom. People have asked questions about what what this passage really means. Leo Tolstoy, is this, is this the blueprint for some utopia? Is that what we stick on our sort of spiritual, virtual reality goggles for, is to actually lift us out of the mundane and lift us out of the, uh, the situations that we're surrounded with and the circumstances where we find ourselves and somehow transport ourselves into some sort of utopia? Um, is it some new higher law? Is actually Jesus just taking all of those legal provisions that were laid down in the Old Testament, which the people of Israel were supposed to live by? And he says, and now I'm going to give you even tougher rules to live by, as if the old ones weren't hard enough. Oh, do we now get even stricter, even more difficult rules for us to live by? Or... Is this something about the quality of life and relationships and the spiritual dynamic that comes to us when we are people who live in his kingdom? And I think that's what he wants us to understand. He's laying out for these people who are standing on a hillside. They, as we last time I was, I was speaking a month or so ago, talked about sort of how hungry his listeners were for a message that was different. They'd got plenty of teachers in their day who were offering them pathways in order to sort of satisfy some of their own feelings. We talked about this whole issue of revenge and they got teachers who were giving them what their twitching ears would want to hear. Well, you know, if somebody's wronged you, this is how you could deal with it. They, they got no shortage of people who were offering them an alternative way to deal with their present circumstances, either to deal with their money or to deal with their relationships or to deal with that need for, for vengeance or to deal with uh, their own poverty. But those messages, they lacked auth authenticity and they lacked authority. And the reason that people came to Jesus in their thousands was because when he spoke, he spoke a better word. He spoke a word that had authority. He spoke a word that made a difference. When they heard him speak, it wasn't just empty words and empty promises they'd, like, they'd heard from everyone else. I don't know what you, you know, who, which voices you listen to, but there's no shortage of people, are there, who will give us wisdom for living. You can go and get any number of books from the library or just download them on your Kindle um, that will help you to understand how to get rich quick or will help, help you to understand how to, you know, treat yourself better or to have better relationships or what they, whatever they are. You can go and get podcasts about those things. And I listen to some of them, you know. I sometimes, uh, what's the Stephen Barclay one about the secret life of the CEO? And I think if I listen to this, Surely my business will succeed and it will grow and, uh, you know, and all of my problems of running teams and uh, challenges of resources, they'll all, they'll all disappear, won't they? Little secret. Doesn't quite work like that, does it? The latest on the bestseller list of how to make your life better. You might find some hints and tips and tricks in there. But there is a reality that we face in humanity, that there is something deep inside us that is looking for something richer and deeper and more meaningful and more lasting. And we're not going to do it by a better system of time management um, or by investing our money in a slightly smarter way. 
the reason that people gathered in their thousands to listen to Jesus and for two millennia have continued to come back to this life-giving word is because they found that by going through the small gate, by entering into a life in the kingdom with him, with him as our guide, him as our teacher, him as the one that we go to for life-giving message day after day after day, there is something that is much more fulfilling. So which identity do we want to inhabit? Which gate do we want to walk through? Um, what's the relationship between us and the sometimes enigmatic teacher uh, who's brought us this message? And I just wanted us to pause at this moment and just ask ourselves, which gate have we gone through? Because actually the broad gate and the wide path on the surface of it looks really attractive and looks really appealing. That's what Jesus seems to intimate here because otherwise, why do so many people go that way? So many people go that way because they think that that is going to be the route that is going to lead them into a place of greater uh, happiness, greater fulfilment. But I, I wonder whether you feel like you picked the path that looked best. A nice flat pathway. It seemed like the sensible route. It seemed like the route that other people that you knew and respected were taking. It seemed like the route that had the best prospects in terms of career or relationships or financial security or personal fulfillment. But as you've started to walk down that path, things haven't necessarily worked out quite the way that you'd hoped they would. And the relationships that looked great haven't necessarily been the relationships that have been as fulfilling as you hoped they were. Or the career opportunities that you thought were there have not necessarily materialised the way that you hoped they might. Or the financial fulfilment or the personal satisfaction has, has ended up feeling pretty empty and you felt hurt and dissatisfied and unfulfilled. And for others of you, sort of, or you might find yourself standing, looking at the narrow gate, looking at this small, offbeat path, and thinking, well, quite honestly, that doesn't look very appealing, does it? I don't know how it might be characterized for you, sort of a life of following Jesus. I mean, you might have looked at it and thought, well, you know, I've seen some Christians, they're not very cool, are they? Um, or is that a path that's actually going to lead to poverty? Does it actually require me to address some of my own, my own attitudes and behaviours? And quite honestly, I, I feel pretty justified thinking the way that I do about some things. And so when we see the small gate, actually we can have a moment of real conflict. Actually, I think it should be a moment of conflict. I think if you, if you think that you walked through the narrow gate without actually finding it a tough choice, then it probably, it might not have been the gate that you were looking for. Because for most of us, when we step through that narrow gate, actually we've found a pathway that has not been devoid of difficulty. The path has sometimes been rocky. Sometimes we found it challenging. Our own attitudes have been challenged. We've been challenged to live sacrificially. We've been challenged to set aside some of our own ambitions in order to do the things that God has called us to do. And yet, that pathway is a path that leads to life. It's a, it's a pathway that has allowed us to come into a place of incredible acceptance in the arms of a father who has lavished his love and his kindness on us. It's a pathway that's led us into moments of immense fulfilment as we've walked in his purposes and he has taken us to places that have allowed us to see his hand at work in our life and to see how we can touch the lives of countless others. It's a pathway that's taken us 
Um, may, maybe not to the place of financial security that we wanted in quite, in fact, my own story is one of personally being taken to places where I think, oh my goodness, how the heck do we get through this financially? And yet God has led us through and he has provided unequivocally and miraculously for our needs. So I just want to pause say to you, which gate have you gone through? And if you feel like actually you started on the broad path and it's not turned out the way that you want, wanted, here's the beauty. We get to go back. This gate, Jesus never says it's locked. It's never barred. He just says it's sometimes hard to find. And you may feel like you might have missed out on the opportunity to go through that small gate and into a life of adventure with God where he is going to walk with you day after day after day. When we were praying before the meeting this morning, I just had this sense out of Psalm 23, which will be familiar to many of you, even if you, know, you haven't spent a lot of time in church. It's that one which says, the Lord's my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and I felt like there was just this sense that there were some people who come here this morning and it feels like life has been tumultuous it feels like you know there's so much turbulence and you're looking for a place of peace and when we walk through the small gate it may not look like it's the ideal place to go and find that place of calm but it's the place that Jesus wants to lead us into and to lead us into green pastures where we get to lie down beside quiet waters and he, he restores our soul. That gate is open for you this morning. It's not locked. It's not barred. It's ready and present. And it's just going to take a little diversion off the path that you've been on. And as I say, I can't, I can't promise that the path is smooth. Like when you stand at the gate, you'll look at it and you'll think, oh my goodness, it looks a bit rocky down there. But I promise you, it's a path that leads to life. Jesus promised that he would give us life and life in all its fullness. And that's where this path leads. Um, the next bit of my message kind of takes us off in a slightly different direction so i just wonder actually whether we could just pray um and wherever you're at whether you feel like oh, hang on a minute i took the narrow path and it's feeling pretty rocky right now and i really would love to see god's provision and i really would love to know his affirmation and i really would love to know his acceptance and i'd really live, love to to get that sense of purpose in my life, or whether you've been walking on the broad path and you're like, hang on, I feel like I've missed something. I really want to step aside through that small gate and find the adventure that's there for me with God. I wonder whether we just stop and pray. Jesus, I want to thank you that you have called each one of us for adventure. There is a journey with you that you desire for us to come on. That, Lord, you have plans and purposes, purposes for each and every one of us in this room that you want us to step into. But, Lord, you present us with a choice, the choice between the path that looks desirous and plentiful and flat and straight that might that will ultimately lead us into difficulty or to choose to step aside through that small gate and into a life of adventure with you that may look rocky and may look difficult and may actually have some pretty challenging steps on the way but where you hold our hand every single day and where you lead us into places of peace, where you lead us into incredible calm, even in the midst of enemies and difficulty and challenge, where you are there with us every single day, where you are the one who speaks an affirming word to us. 
You call us on as your children. You speak promise and purpose into our hearts. You affirm us wherever we step and you provide for us every step of the way. And Lord, I, I just, I want to pray, Lord, for each one of us that we would hear your call right now to step through the small gate, to go on the narrow path, but to find in you everything that is the desire of our hearts, everything that we felt we're missing, everything that that void in our soul has not been able to be filled with is filled in you. And so Jesus, we just, I want to pray that every one of us today would put our little hands into your big hand and step on that journey with you afresh. Lord, would you be the one who leads us? You be the one who guides us. You be the one who provides for us. You be the one who affirms us. You be the one who calls us. I pray you do it right now in, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Um, yeah. That's a precious direction for us this morning. It just ties in with a, a thought I had when I was praying earlier, and I wasn't quite sure when to mention it, but I think, I think now, I, now I will. I, I, I had an interesting experience yesterday. Um, uh, we've, uh, we have a garage full of stuff. Stuff from the past. Old bits of furniture, which I've, we've inherited. Um, various other, all the stuff that we couldn't put in our house when we moved, I just said, I'll just put it in the garage and one day I'll deal with it. Well, four and a half years later, yesterday was the day I dealt with it. And I, I, it was quite an interesting experience because I thought, there's some stuff here that needs to be thrown away. And there's some stuff here that needs to be valued and kept. There's some stuff here that needs to be given away. But what I need to do is empty the garage completely on our, on our uh, front bit of our house in full view of my neighbours. So I did. I took out the whole lot, every bit of it. And I got hot and I got sweaty and I got a little bit irritable. Every now and then I stopped and came inside and watched the cricket. And, the, uh, and then it was... <laughs> and through the day, I sort of took this stuff out and there it was outside and, and, the, and the, the garage was empty. And then I put it back again. Well, some stuff I put in the, I put in the car and took to the tip, got rid of it. Some stuff I, um, I just I moved everything around and eventually by about six o'clock, I got the things I needed to sell or get rid of at the front, so that was easier. The other things at the back, we moved them, emptied the freezer, moved it, put everything back in again. And I thought, oh, give me a drink. <laughs> I sat down. And this morning, I got up and I went to the freezer and I went into the, I went to the garage and I thought, oh, this is better. This is better. Why didn't I do this earlier? And, and peace came with me. And the rubbish I'd thrown away, that had gone. The stuff that needed to go somewhere else was there. And I just felt, as I was praying about this this morning, some of us do need to do this, to pause. And actually to the stuff that we've been thinking about for some years to deal with, now is the time. Now is the time to deal with it. Now is the time to throw out the rubbish. And you do that by bringing it to Christ, recognising it's wrong, dealing with it, repenting of it, throwing it in the bin, and receiving the forgiveness of God. It's another metaphor, if you like, of starting afresh. It's a bit like going through the narrow gate. I think for some of us who've been Christians for a while, there are some issues that you've been meaning to deal with for years. And actually, the whole, as we've gone through this Sermon on the Mount series, God has actually very gently underlined it. 
because it was gently underlined it, you probably didn't take as much notice of it as you could have done. And he got, might have under, underlined things as we've gone through this series. And I feel this morning's an invitation for you to actually bring the change, bring the adjustment that God wants you to bring. Because as you do that, you'll come back a few days later and you'll go, oh, that's better. And it might be one of the it might have been one of the beatitudes. Ah, yes, I did hear God about being humble and poor in spirit, but I haven't really sort of made that adjustment. That message we had on lust and anger. I do need to deal with that firmly. A bit about putting God first. Yes, I do need to deal with that. And for some, it's a chance to enter through the narrow gate. 